We've reflected on the many aspects of the life of Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu over the last few days. He was involved in social development, the church and international relations. But what kind of a political influence did he have? Well, to talk more on this, I'm joined by political analyst Dr. Soma Dota Figeni. Doctor, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your time. You, I would say, are among those who have followed the Archer's social and political activism from his support of the black consciousness movement that emerged from the country's 1960s student milieu to his advocacy around the LGBTI community to calling out political leaders, among those in particular being Mobutu Sese Seko and Mugabe, which one would say is indicative of a man who didn't subscribe to a level of black consciousness that would have one blindly supporting African leaders. He was truly principled. Just Take us through this giant's history in the space of political activism, rather, from the pulpit to the streets in that infamous cassock that we all knew him to wear. Well, I do think that uh, first let's convey our condolences to the Tutu family and the broader family of the Tutus. And uh, he represents a particular cohort of leadership and he is an outstanding person or leader who has had a footprint at different epochs of our liberation struggle going back to the 80s, I mean to the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. He had so much influence on the church and the issue of liberation theology to say you can't just pray without being actively involved. And that in itself had a great influence on black theology, which converged with black consciousness. But also he helped a great deal to make it quite fashionable for churches to be sanctuaries and the supporters of those who were fighting for liberation and therefore had nowhere to go but to get the sanctuary in the churches and the formation of the mass democratic movement in the 80s he had become such a giant symbol during that period of the liberation struggle and he would still be there during our transition to a new democratic system as he headed the truth and reconciliation commission as he championed quite a number of uh, you know uh, uh, causes during the transition up to the time where he was spreading the word through his foundation. Mm. Are you not perhaps saddened, though, when you speak of this man, that there are those that seek to confine or define him with just one single moment as TRC chair? Because this moment of being the chair was preceded by several events of activism, political activism at the heart of it. Are you not somehow saddened by what we've seen on social media with people seeking to diminish his importance and his contribution to the struggle? But also remember that we've reached an era of social media where any hero or heroine is shot down. Neither Mandela nor Tutu nor Winnie Mandela or several other leaders have been able to stand the social media space, which is not regulated, and very often it does not represent the majority of opinions. Because social media... It's where post-truth era is well expressed. It's where propaganda is well expressed. It's where anger and bitterness congest. And it's where anonymity can also be used as a reason for casting such aspersions. We've seen this, and the word sellout is readily used, whether it's a Mandela, it's a Tutu, it's every other person much because many of the people may not have gone through the struggle itself and may not appreciate the complexities these leaders had to deal with. And of course, they were never saints. They made their own mistakes. But it is precisely because what trailblazing work they did overcame every other mistake. And we've come to that era where a single story is used to diminish people and literally to make sure that no one is left standing. Even the Constitution itself has become a victim. Conspiracy hmm. theories are around. Nothing stands in the era of post-truth.
It's only people who care about facts, who appreciate complexity, who should keep raising the voice. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if we speak of that single story as chair of the TRC, we can't even say that there was anything particularly wrong that took place there, because again, many people fail to appreciate that you operate within the confines of the terms of reference, that you must always seek to understand what was the intention and was it achieved? What was in fact the goal? Do you see that there is just that confusion? Or I spoke to Mr. Trikamji just before you, and I spoke of perhaps in the absence of justice or failure in the courts that people have now sought to revise the intention of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that they were failed by the justice system. But in the absence of that process having been triggered or taken place against those who didn't seek pardon, that we now have to go back and say the TRC failed. Indeed, what we saw in the TRC was a very bold experiment with truth and reconciliation and it was surely an unfinished business as uh, one who reflected on this including to mr and has always said this and several other members of the trc we must also remember that the recommendations of the trc were not fully implemented we must also remember that the failure to fundamentally transform apartheid geography and to address the challenges that faced the victims of the apartheid era did not rest just with the TRC, but TRC was meant to trigger that and move forward. And mm. government and leaders of the time were supposed to take the process forward. And it is still a challenge today to say, how do we make real the promises of our liberation promises? And that in itself is still a challenge, and it can no longer be government alone. Private sector should play its place, its part, and uh, civil society should play its part. The intelligentsia should play its part in trying to make sure that we frame our discourse correctly so that it doesn't become a witch hunt, who is a hero, who is a villain, and fail to appreciate the complexity of each moment and the compromises that were made during those moments. Mm -hmm. No, most certainly, and we must say that his contribution to the struggle is well documented. You know, based on that, I wonder if post-apartheid, those erstwhile leaders didn't sit and think that the arch was probably the most dangerous of the activists and should have possibly been assassinated because his peaceful approach disarmed them. And time and time again, we've read that they confiscated his passport but returned it eventually only for the arch to travel abroad and continue with his anti-government rhetoric, appealing to the conscience of those world leaders. Do you think... He was probably that elusive enemy that they wish they could have probably dealt with a bit earlier. Surely there is no doubt that his global profile, his profile within the country had become quite an inconvenience. And as such, we had seen several attempts to frustrate him. And we've seen several attempts to pledges such as uh, Frank Chikane. And uh, they probably would have thought that uh, his moral, being a moral force in society had become quite a challenge. But quite interestingly, though, even those who might have thought as such, when he became consistent in calling for fight against corruption, when he became, uh, you know, consistent in critiquing some of the failures of the current government, you'll find that the very same people started appreciating him because his moral persuasion, his deep conviction, it's what was driving him rather than the government of the day. Certainly a man of, of great principle because you even touched on black theology, speaking of the level of consciousness. But as I said a bit earlier, that he called out the regime of Mobutu Sese Seko. He called out Robert Mugabe. So he wasn't that type of a guy that if you're a pan-Africanist at heart, you're expected to constantly just blindly accept what is and call it Africa, or black excellence or uh, pan-Africanism. In fact, Pan-Africanism ought to have an element of self-introspection which is critical. Correct. It is not just a romantic notion of unity. It must critique weaknesses which take place there. 
And if you have any Pan-Africanism that failed to do that, then you would be lending yourself to some of the autocrats around and some of the personal rule regimes that you find around and uh, who abuse the very rights of Africans who are supposed to be liberated by Pan-African ideology. So he was right on spot in making sure that whenever there were dictatorships, he was critiquing them as well. Mm -hmm. And then beyond studying the man, take us through maybe your most fondest memories of him or personal interactions with him. Well, the personal interactions that we had with him in, on several occasions, it's when he highlighted a number of issues about social justice, but more importantly, his sense of humor. He could combine in his intellect both the seriousness of a clergyman, the moral stories, and as well as the sense of humor that he had. I remember one time uh, we were hosting him at Michigan State University when he was telling the story about Americans being the first to land on the moon and saying that uh, South Africans would be the first one to land on the sun, yeah. even if uh, the sun were to bend them. So that sense of humor, that charisma, and his power of oratory and public address, and that in itself was able to carry his message through.